What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary, episode 21. And why do we call it No Labels Necessary? Because today, artist, musician, content creator, entrepreneur, we got to be all of these things these days. So just remove the labels. They're not necessary. And you can catch us talking about just that on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, and anywhere you listen to a podcast every Tuesday and Thursday, where again, we talk about the intersection of music, culture, and money for content creators and artists. So let's get into today's topic. Oh, but before we do that, Please, we're trying to get to 150,000 subscribers. So hit that subscribe button and don't keep the pod to yourself. Share it with your folks. Share it with your folks. But now let's get into topic number one, which brings me to a very important, very, very, very important question. What is one of the worst things that you can do as an artist when you start making money? Rich homie Quan has an answer for y'all. Shit fucked my head up. I blew the money went to my head too fast, bro. And I, and I can admit that now. You know, so I got cocky. I stopped, I stopped caring. Like, I felt like I can say anything on the song. Now. I'm singing more than rapping now. I feel like, oh, this shit this easy? Oh, I ain't even got to even try no more. And I ain't gonna lie, I got, I got lost in the sauce. Straight like that. Lost in the sauce. Lost in the sauce, boss. Don't do it. The biggest thing out of all that, right, is. The music, the impact on the music. Yeah. That's what I hear. I can do whatever now. Right? I can do whatever now. Exactly. That part right there is like, that right there is where you fall off. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. when you think about it, yeah, you can get cocky and start like mistreating people in your life. You know, not saying you should do all that, right? And buying stuff you shouldn't buy, whatever, whatever. But when it affects the music. Not the music, man. <laughs> like he, like he said, I start singing more than rapping, and for him, that's not his thing. I guess that's the point where why he's saying that, mm. right? I mean, come on, like ne- the fans are gonna be like, I don't want to hear this, right? Yeah. At some point, or it's just not hitting the way it would. And the fans, a lot of times, you you don't quite know. Like if it's not like straight trash music, it's hard to articulate why I don't play this twenty times like I play that other track. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, letting money go to your head to the point that you think you could just do anything on the track. Because it wasn't just the money, by the way. Like, the way he talks around this time, um, more in this interview with DJ Vlad, it's also the fact that he was in his own. He was catching hit after hit, right? So, that also makes you feel like you can do about anything. Yeah. Yeah, bro. And it's interesting because it's one of those things that you can sometimes feel as a fan, right? Like, man, something's off here. And I was like, oh, you were starving when you made that last album. Now you mm. you you good. You up. You know what I'm saying? You have yeah. ramen for lunch. And yeah. I, so I, I do think that that was interesting that that was the first point that he brought up. Was like, yo, the music was hit. But also I, I do think about that time. At that time I was a I was a, a Rich Homie Coin fan. I personally liked when he started kind of singing a little bit more. Like I, I thought yeah. he was a cool rapper, but to me he was better when he kind of merged the two together. Yeah, me too. Especially at that time because it wasn't – I think that was when we were starting to get into like the whole melodic – rap thing like really getting out there like that so it was just cool to see somebody at least from atlanta like kind of yeah paving that way him so, and thug were bringing that in a whole another level right thug was going crazy yeah. crazy with it but he was finding a different groove that was like respectable for someone who didn't want to go to the extreme that thug was going because you yeah. know when, when thug came bitch get the fuck out of my face yeah. so we'll get it right. and we had schoolie he, yeah, schoolie, schoolie, schoolie was on it yeah, right you know, schoolie so they were coming with that yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and Quan found a, a a space that fit like his type of rapper yeah right so no nah, man I, I i actually did like the singing it was that one track man what was the last track that he did um ooh, ooh, ooh. yes but that's not the, the name of it <laughs> right flex yeah there we go flex <laughs> That right there, that right there was I, I love that song, bro. Mm, interesting. Now I fuck with many of his. I don't know if it's my favorite song, but he himself felt like that was a song that wasn't him. Yeah, he, I think he said he hated it or something like that. Right? Yes, yeah. he said something like that, yeah. right? Where so I don't know how it came to his, you know, to his table or whatever. But like I thought that shit was dope in terms of a. A elevation of him. I didn't, that wasn't a space I would want him to stay in as a fan, like, oh, all your songs all of a sudden are that far in that direction. But, you know, artists that you really rock with, especially in that type of space, you want something that you can kind of like dance to or hit a certain type of club energy and pace to. 
And he didn't have a track that could play in that way. Right? Mm-hmm. His other ones brought other energy, like some type of way, right? Yeah. That's like a more hard. I mean, it actually is yeah. is literally what it says. Like flex is like I'm flexing, like that's yeah. a different energy. Some type of way that was more like, hey, make you feel some type of way. Um it actually is a different type of flex when you think about it. Yeah. 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 But like <laughs> all right. So like the, the whole point is like I think he fit a different energy with that song. I liked it, but I can see how he felt like shit, even that shit that I hated took off. So that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to kind of uh content credit episode we had a couple episodes ago where I'm like, if I'm an influencer and I've sold chicken nuggets and socks and you know I'm saying t shirts, like who are you to tell me what I can't sell? He probably felt the same way, bro. Like every yeah. even like you said, even the things I put out that I maybe didn't believe in hit, bro, I'm I'm up right now. You know what I'm saying? Like who's gonna who's gonna stop me? Mm-hmm. And I but I do feel like this is one of the more like wholesome things that we've heard, you know, of, in terms of an artist like changing after after they got money, like I, I, I expected that clip to take a, a bad turn. You know, so I'm not even gonna lie to you. I came yeah. into a, a 100% pessimistic. You know, what I'm saying about where he was going with that. So that that's pretty tame. But yeah, to let it touch the art, bro. Yeah, it, well, it's gonna touch the art. I, I think that's the part. Whether that, you want to or not. Yeah, it's just the fact that he was even thinking. Yeah. Right. Not oh, I'm different in my life and now it's bleeding over. It's just like no, I'm thinking I could do anything. Yeah. That's uh, that's a different space. I man, I mean, you know, man, when you make ooh, ooh, ooh bro, you, know what I'm <laughs> you, you move different. Question, did you like Flex? Not at first. It was one of those songs where the internet convinced me to like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it was I like, if you had told me, when that, what was it, like 2015 or something like that? Mm-hmm. You had told me, you know what I'm saying, years before that, that Rich Homie Clone was going to have one of the most popular dance songs of a year. I would have never <laughs> believed that. I'm like, what? Rich Homie Coin? Differences, Rich Homie Coin? Some type of way? So, but no, I hated that song when it first came out. And like, right. it was like, it, I remember that being like the viral dance trend. I don't, I don't remember what platform was lit. Oh, I forgot about that. Was it like Vine or something yeah, was lit yeah. at the time? Something, bro. I just remember some social media platform won me over. It wasn't the song. The social media platform got won you, me over. Got you. For me, the beat, it was so different. Yeah. That thum, 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 yeah. thum. Like that, just, that shit hit different. And then his voice was an instrument. Him and Thug, when they came the way they like they actually had these voices that just made songs sound different. Yeah. So that's it. Like it it just hit in a way that I was fucking with just from a a, a sonic standpoint. Cause I go off a of feel first. I know some people go off of lyrics first, yeah. like what they hear. I go off a of feel first. And I was like, bro, I like the way this shit feels. Oh, whatever. Man. Yeah. So I don't know, man. Like it's it's interesting that you can get in that zone where you feel like I can't do anything, but we all find out that we aren't the superheroes that we find, <laughs> that we so believe. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's Kevin Hart in the hotel room smashing, forgetting that, hey, brother, you still a man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it is what it is. But, like, which, you know, he said himself. So, I, I mean, look, take he artists, I know many of y'all aren't in that position yet, but there's other versions of, Think you can find some type of momentum. Don't let it go to your head. Remember the music is the thing of all things that you can't allow to be affected. Guard that with your your life as an artist. And then we're gonna just go straight into the second topic. Not even giving a smooth segue. We're just getting right into it. Question number two. Should indie artists release music on Fridays? Now, where did this question come from? It came from Brand Man Network Space. I want to go through these topics or these discussion points because i think people brought up a lot of great points shout out to ryan leeson for asking this question for those of y'all who don't know what the brand man network space it's a completely free space so if you as an artist wants to join this conversation a manager or a label owner wants to not only join these conversations and be able to talk with us or our community you can actually get on calls with our team for free um and learn some things right we got we got some knowledge, some courses um, that really break down our process that we use in our agency to blow up artists that are a lot more specific than these videos even get. All oh, that's free. But let's get back to this question. Indie artists releasing music on Fridays. What's your opinion on an indie artist releasing singles and music videos on Fridays when the major artists do it as well? 
Do you think that the audience being primed to expect new music outweighs the cost of competing for views with major artists? By the way, it's brandmannetwork.com. If you want to um, hop in this space, you have to in, um, apply for an invite, but brandmannetwork.com. Now, Sean Ward, I think, has a great response. I don't think it's relevant for newer artists. Major label artists follow this old guard because charts are tallied Friday to Friday. And they are usually just using it to place higher on the charts to push to PR and media. The public as a whole does not put much weight on what a what day a new song drops. Doesn't even matter to them what day they heard it as long as they liked it when they do. Corey, what do you think about that? 100% agree. Like the, the notion that things need to hit on Friday is a complete industry thing. Yeah. I think we kind of touched on a different episode, but it's one of those rules to the game where if you're not at the level where that rule really matters, you really have no real reason to follow it. But like, I like the fact that like we're starting to see more artists kind of break that Friday mode and put. All right. One second. One second. Hey, uh, babe. Babe. Yeah. I got you on this podcast. I got a question right quick for you. <laughs> What day? What day does new music come out on? <laughs> uh, Tuesday. All right, bet that's all I needed. Appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> there you go. From a regular consumer, <laughs> these fans don't know, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't know when this music come out, bro. So that answers a lot for you right yeah, there. Yeah, bro. Like, that's, so many artists need to move off of consumer matches, bro. Like, their comments are, bro, fans don't care. If I learned about it from a TikTok on Wednesday, as far as I'm concerned, that shit might as well have came out on Wednesday. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I had a, um, a friend who kind of saw this uh, recently. Like, uh, Sam, when he worked the Curtis Waters project mm -hmm. song, they put it out on a Tuesday. He was terrified, you know what I'm saying? Because he's like, oh, we're skipping the whole Friday thing. I remember him breaking down. He was like, well, you know, we're not expecting to possibly chart anyway, so we don't, we don't care about that. The only point that he brought up that somebody else actually brings up is New Music Friday, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's probably the other reason that artists would think to want to drop on the Fridays if you're an artist that thinks you have a chance of hitting New Music Friday. But what I learned from the Curtis Waters campaign um, that Sam was running is that if you put that shit out on whatever day of the week and they like it, they still gonna put you on New Music Friday. Like I said, he, Curtis Waters released, I can't think of the song, it was like Star Man, Star something. Mm -hmm. They released on a Tuesday, New Music Friday rolled around, he was on New Music Friday, everything was good. So that to me was like, oh, so this shit really don't matter. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like if I can still hit that point, this shit really don't matter, bro. So if you're an artist that knows, let's say not even for a fact, but you have, you know you have a 99.9% .9 chance of not charting. There's no reason for you to put this shit out on a Friday. Unless you just want to. Hey, facts. And I love that comment because speaking on the charts, right? Mm. Why do they do it for the charts? Well, he said PR. Mm -hmm. It's not just PR. I say this all the time. These people work in corporations. These labels are corporations. And it's just like any other corporation where people get bonuses. There's all types of incentives for achieving certain metrics. Mm -hmm. That's why they need to make sure they're measured and they have a full week, right? Because they want to give themselves the maximum amount of time to achieve as good as metrics as they can, right? Yeah. That first week number really, really matters, right? But many artists who don't have any streams, right, would love to have 2 million streams over a year just as much as having two million streams over a week and not having any, any streams after that, yeah. right? Or five hundred thousand and slowly getting there. Like it doesn't matter how you get there as an indie artist. You're just trying to make sure you get it at this point. Yeah. Right. So following all of these industry norms doesn't make sense if you're going an indie route because there's so much in place that we don't question. Right. Because that's just what everybody else is doing. But when yeah. you realize, oh, this is because they have things that have nothing to do with the fans and the listenership. But I have to do this because of my my industry makeup. It completely changes everything. There's this story about <laughs> this daughter. Like would. Uh, she followed her mom's recipe and she cut 
the turkey on each side, right? That was the whole thing. We got to cook this turkey and she cuts off both ends of the turkey, right? Think of like that regular turkey that you buy in the, in the store, not with the head and everything, All right? right? All so right. you're cutting both heads on both sides, right? And her husband asks, like, why do you do that? And she's like, oh, you know, that's what my mom does. And she's like, hey, mom, like, why do we cut both sides of the turkey? And she's like, oh, yeah, that's what your grandma does. And she go to grandma. Grandma, why do you cut both sides of the turkey? Because mom does that and now I'm doing it or whatever. But my husband asks, why I do why you do that? And she was like, Oh, my pan was too small. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she why she did it, right? Makes no sense when you project that to the future and you're in different different circumstances. Yeah. And a lot of times that's the analogy for how artists on the indie side are operating trying to follow these industry norms that are norms for reasons that have been established way before this climate even existed, yeah. let alone the fact that you're not even in this system in today's climate. So like artists, man, like they just, just think different, differently about this stuff, but there's, there's so much more in terms of the commentary in this space. I want to, let's read somebody else's. Uh, Jamal Harvey said, playing devil's advocate for a smaller artist it doesn't have any bearing on the metrics, really. It's more of being in sync with the industry for New Music Fridays. With that being said, platforms, publications, radio, bloggers, etc., still hold to that tradition. I release my artist's music on Fridays unless it's a mixtape or cover. Those are on Tuesday. It's a great way to market if you choose to use the, those said platforms. Now, that's interesting that Tuesday just keeps coming up. Right? It's all the they could be any day other than Friday, and literally it's came up three times, right? Yeah, I think he mentions it. Oh, right there, yeah, in that comment. Which one? Totally oh. understand her or Jamal? Yeah, right there, Jamal. Yeah. All right. So personal, all right, okay. Personal reasons these days, new music used to be released on Tuesday for Billboard metrics. Ah, uh, yeah, it did used to be released on Tuesday before the streaming shit changed everything. You're right. Now I use it to push freestyles or covers due to less traffic, which can give a further reach. I am also testing metrics to see which genre consumes their music mostly in those said time frames. Interesting. Jamel, I, we got to talk to you. I really like the fact, the way you're approaching everything and measuring everything. Corey, you had something to say about that? Nah, man. Yeah, he, he hit on the head. I, yeah. I forgot about the Tuesday thing, though. I did. Yeah. I really did forget that music would, <laughs> used to be released on Tuesday. But again, that would be equivalent though if somebody was still dropping everything on Tuesday. It's like, oh yeah, because it used to be a relevant thing. So all these things are whenever, whatever today. Like you can make your own rules. There are truly no rules. Nina says, I think even though indie artists don't have to, I do it anyway because I know Thursday and Friday are the days most people expect new music to come out. And now let's get this other part of the conversation going, all right? Because y'all just saw my girl had no idea when the music came out, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of times we feel like these norms are something that everybody knows, but they're really just our bubble of the industry, mm -hmm. all right? That's why I've always said when industry plant became this common thing or whatever, and I'm like, all right, stop worrying about whether someone else or uh, whether someone or not thinks you're an industry plant or whether somebody else is an industry plant because general fans don't even know that word exists. Never heard of that shit before. So you're thinking about something that, that has nothing to do with the fan base or people you're actually trying to sell to. We get caught up in a lot of this industry thing and think it's real and it's not a reflection of the, the mm -hmm. world at large. So there's that. But the point that somebody said in terms of in comparison to um, music as a whole, other artists, right? Attention and saturation. No one is listening to you because they're not listening to another artist and no one's not going to listen to you because they're listening to another artist. Yeah, I hate that argument. So like much. it just doesn't work because there's so much content these days. Yeah. Right. It's very, very rare and very, very f few and far between in terms of the artists that people will like literally kind of like cut everything off for yeah. a bit. Right. Yeah. And yeah. those artists are still relative to your genre. Everybody don't like Drake. He's some, somebody that a lot of people might go stop and listen to, but everybody doesn't like Drake. Yeah. Everybody don't like Taylor Swift. Everybody don't like 21 Savage. Everybody don't like some of these, like whoever you name, Rihanna, whatever. Everybody doesn't like everybody. So 
you have to also gauge it that way. If there's somebody in your drama, maybe that you know is going to take over and people are going to hear in the end and they might take a good portion of it. Maybe it's something to kind of think about. Right. But for the most part, people just aren't thinking about it that way from yeah. my experience. No, I agree, bro. I, I hate that argument so much. It was like, bro, like we, we all have the capacity to your mix. Your project about to be 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like I got time to listen to some other stuff that I, I want to yeah. listen to. So yeah, I, I just always a personally hated that argument. Even on, on top of that, because like you touched on, like it's really just content. So like consumers, we kind of already got in our head. Like I'm, I'm bouncing around to a couple, a couple of things that you ain't even really competing with just music today. Or you compete with all the YouTube videos that drop, all the streamers that are streaming, right? Mm-hmm. Like really just like content as a whole. Right. And so like that to me, may, uh, what I've come to realize is that because of the amount of music being released, the amount of content being released, like there's always going to be noise, yes. right? And so the argument I think he was making is like, you know, don't do Friday because it's easier to break through the noise. Maybe the music noise, but not the noise, <laughs> not the noise in general. Yeah, bro, exactly. And you as an indie artist, you're still trying to figure out how to get attention, period. Exactly. Like that's what you need to be thinking about. Not, yeah, whose noise you're trying to break yeah. through. Because are you even good at getting that attention yet, period? Yeah. And it's like, it's, and, you know, good practice to learn how to break through the noise because you're going to be doing it for a long time. So, you know, so uh, and it might kind of sound like it, it fights a little bit harder for the, the Friday release. But, you know, like I said, at this point, there's so many artists dropping music that I'm pretty sure there's music coming out every day. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if, we, if we were to really look into I'm pretty sure music comes out every day. And like you said, we don't know who consumers are paying attention to. So I might be, you know, we, we kind of have, I think music artists have this idea of the fan like that has been trained by the industry to Think of Fridays as the day, but at this point, it's like, okay, I watch this guy drop a song on Monday. I watch this guy drop a song on Tuesday. I seen you drop a song on mm-hmm. Thursday, right? So consumers are getting this information from so many different places that to them, they probably just wake up every day and expect some shit, right? It's almost like a like a like a roulette. Like I don't know who I'm gonna get something from today. I yeah. just know something is coming today, right? Exactly. And that really is how it feels, bro. Being a music fan, like I don't know who gonna drop today, but somebody dropping something today. You know what I'm saying? Right. So. How many artists that actually have a decent name and you are willing to check out their music whenever it comes out, yeah. but you don't catch it the day it comes out yeah. and you hear about it a couple of days after. And so now you check it out. So it, like the marketing beyond the actual day is usually what's going to bring people in. Right. It's not just the release itself. It's not, oh, I'm just about to go through all my Spotify on on, on Friday yeah. and see everything that came out. It's not necessarily that for a lot of people. Now, again, the industry kind of moves on a different pace because, oh, we're marketers or we're artists or we're labels. We might go look for stuff that way. Yeah. But that's not the behavior of the masses. But I will say an argument for dropping when everybody else isn't dropping is the ability to stand out, right? And I know that's what people are thinking in general. So I'll say it like this. But again, I don't think it's completely relevant here because you have to break from everybody, right? You do have to break out from everybody, the content from everybody uh, from everybody else, not just the other artists releasing music. But when you do something, when other people aren't doing it, you have more of an opportunity to make it unique, mm-hmm. right? Like I always say, Giving out turkeys during Thanksgiving is something that doesn't really get appreciated that much because everybody's giving out turkeys during Thanksgiving. Yeah. Pre and post COVID, maybe less, right? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. if you do that shit in the middle of the summer and you're doing this homeless drive, people are going to be like, oh man, you're doing something special because nobody else is doing that at a time. Yeah. Right. So you get looked at as a more giving artists because you get more attention for that specific thing but there's an expectation for you to give during the holidays yeah right so it doesn't stand out as much so you want to think about multiple things you do as your, for your brand as a whole your music as a whole as that if you can find those pockets where things are missing and, and put it out of expectation then you can get a lot of gains for it music itself because the cycle feels so constant I think the argument for a day to make it stand out more than the other is probably not as strong. Yeah, it just I agree. isn't. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, Maybe Sundays. Sunday could be. Yeah. Right. Sunday could be. Now, if I was an artist too, and I had a song that was like relevant to Sunday, even when like Kanye was doing the uh, Sunday services, yeah, right? Yeah. You drop it on Sunday. It's a part of a theme. Again, it stands yeah. out. It feels yeah. like something special, right? So, yeah. 
Yeah, Sundays though. Yeah, I could definitely see that with Sundays. <laughs> I see that. Now, how do you get attention to your music as an artist? One of the ultimate ways is marketing. And 50 Cent dropped some interesting information on Jay-Z's marketing budget. We're going to play this clip of 50 Cent giving y'all inside information. And we think y'all are going to enjoy when, when it. So check this out right here. When When you've been an artist that's been prioritized for, by a major label, you've had marketing dollars around your launches. Mm -hmm. If you watch Jay, he's not launching without the money. Exactly. He always has like some kind and of like launching, sponsors. You see 444 and, yeah. and just everywhere, little buses and all kind of stuff riding around. And, and you gotta say to yourself, when is the last time you've seen someone do that? You haven't even seen it for Beyonce. Your pop divas like your Mariah Carey's, your uh, Jennifer Lopez or your Jenna Jackson's, those different artists would at points have marketing campaigns that reach the excess of $20 million. Major record companies are not gonna spend that much money on their project, so they gotta figure out how to create campaigns that mirror that or the audience doesn't understand. Like their, their audience will feel like she was so big. Remember how big she was? What they're saying is she had so much marketing Remember how big the marketing campaign was? God. 50 Cent. It's a bar. With more bars. More bars, man. He He's at the top for just bars and regular speech outside of music. Yeah. When it comes to like game and the music industry and stuff, I, I, I really rock with that. But one thing that you mentioned from this, because there's so many points that we can break down from this. The first thing I want to talk about is controlling perception. You brought that up, so I want you know, you know, give your perspective on how that relates to controlling perception. Yeah, so the last bar being, you know, what do you say? Uh, fans would be like, "Oh, you remember this artist and how big they were," and what they're really saying is, "Hey, you remember that time we put a lot of money into the marketing, or the label put a lot of money into the marketing?" And so I don't think enough people think about how much of marketing is really just controlling perception by making the artist seem bigger than they are. Mm -hmm. so we do it, right? Like we, we do it a lot, you know what I'm saying? Um, I sell artists on that all the time when they talk about campaigns. I'm like, yo, sometimes the goal isn't necessarily to get you popping, it's to make you look more popping than you are so people feel like they're behind. Yep. And they, they feel like they need to catch up. Man, I've seen you in all of these different places that, that I pay attention to and know about, like, who are you? I've never heard of you before, right? Yep. A lot of times that can be controlled with marketing dollars, right? Um, and so I like that because, like I said, that's something that we stick on to a lot. It's like a lot of the, these things that we're about to do for artists during campaigns, you know, if the budget is there, the content is there, the narrative is there, it's really just like, yeah, we about to make you, we about to string this together to make you look more lit than you may be right now, but if it hits right, it's gonna click and you will be, you know, mm -hmm. lit. You know what I'm saying? Like you will be lit. And it's like so much of that really can be controlled with just marketing dollars. That controls the platforms you can be on, how many other platforms you can be on, how long your ads run for. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like so many different elements that contribute to that that overall just I guess power of litness, you know what I'm saying, or um or the overall like perception of litness. And that it there's even another like concept that we throw out a lot where we always talk to clients about building omnipresence. Yep. Right. And so for, for those who are listening, omnipresence is really just seeming like you're everywhere to a, a, a small group of people, right? Or a massive group of people, depending on how big you are. But we, we always explain it to a small group of people, but let's just say a, a target audience, right? Like omnipresence is seeming like you're everywhere to this, this target audience. And so the more that you can make that happen, which an example could be, like we said, you're posting content. So I'm seeing you because of that. Right, these eight different outlets I follow are, are posting about you. I see your ads. I get on this playlist and I see you on this playlist. Right, I turn on the TV. You on like Jay Leno or some shit, right? And so you as a consumer start to feel like, like, damn, this person must be lit. I'm literally seeing him or her everywhere, not even thinking about this is a person like me who strung this shit together exactly like this. Yo, we're gonna make sure you hit these accounts five or six different times. We're gonna have your ads retargeting yep. these people, right? Yo, keep posting so you, you pop up in the algorithm, then you know your label go get you on Jay Leno or something, right? Um, because for whatever reason we feel like your fans are paying attention to Jay Leno. But literally all we're trying to do is control perception. And that's it. You know, and it's like who he 
that can control perception, you know what I'm saying, literally controls the way the fans move. Yeah, that perception becomes reality, right? Yeah. Because, like you said, people begin to feel like there must be some power, some importance to this thing that I continue to see. Yeah. Right. And everybody feels like this thing is everywhere. Somebody else is saying this is important. So it feels like everybody else is saying it's important. When I see it in enough places, then therefore it has to be important. Yeah. Maybe I should check it out and be a part of it. That is a real thing. So that perception becomes reality is like is not a phrase for the sake of it. But the point that I think about hearing all that is the risk of not having the same perception when you're at a certain level, yeah. right? He said Jay Z doesn't release without a certain amount of money, and we remember when he did the Samsung deal and it was exclusive on Samsung. Jay Z's done multiple deals like that, mm -hmm. right? Where he navigates and uses some funds and sponsorships for something else yeah. beyond the label. Now. We know that it's to make sure that the money's there to maintain the perception. Yeah. All right. Not just, oh, this is a cool business move in general. Right. No, I can't risk looking like I didn't hit on the same level I hit on before because that might be a big level for an artist lower than me. But for me, it's a step or two down, mm -hmm. which has an impact. And once you have the perception of going down, that perception can continue and manifest it with me falling all the way off. Yeah. Right. So as you navigate, all right, your battle of perception will change once in the beginning, you're trying to appear bigger than you are, like you said. Right. But then over time, it's all about maintaining because you might not even get as, you know, you might not be able to get any bigger. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you're playing two sides, right. On the way up. I'm trying to get bigger. I get big enough. Now I'm trying to get bigger and I look smaller. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. the game I'm playing. Yeah. I also think, too, it, that clip is important because, you know, how many artists have you heard say they want to move like certain bigger artists, but they don't really understand what's being put into the market? But like he said, if you're a priority, well, and this is a different time, so we got to throw it out there, but yeah. I, I'm assuming that clip was late 2000s. Yeah. But, you know, he said, if you're a priority act, but they're spending $20 million on you. 20 right? mil. And then there'll be an artist somewhere that's like, hey, I want to move like that artist, but you don't have 20 million dollars. You know what I'm saying? Different. And like, so that's imp that's important context because like you see them doing things, you sometimes see things stringing together and you just think that it's just happening by the, the, the graces of the universe. And it's like, no, bro, money was spent. I personally have trained myself to assume that any moment I see an artist having was paid for yeah. Even if I'm wrong, it, it it soothes my brain. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't try to start racking myself for the answers that ain't that ain't gonna be there. Right. And like that was something that just kind of came along as I had like other conversations. I I think I told you about it before, but one of my most eye opening conversations ever uh, was this was maybe a couple years ago. Yeah, this was like pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend actually I don't want to say his name. One of my friends is a, is, a, is a great guy, a great manager, and he was managing an artist that started popping at the time. And he was going to LA to just meet with a bunch of different labels about his artists, and he invited me out, you know what I'm saying? So we could split Ubers, you know what I'm saying? Be cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we were meeting with this one, uh, this one head of a and the label, and she's talking to him, and she's like, man, like I admire y'all for really wanting to do the indie route, but do y'all have the money for for marketing like you think you do? And then my homie's like, yeah, you know, we got, you know, this investor thinking about, we, you know, we're pulling this money together. He's making this much. I think we can make it happen. And she's like, you know, I don't know. Like, you know, do you know how much Dua Lipa spends on marketing? And my ears perk up. I'm like, how much How much does Dua Lipa spend on marketing? And she's like, a lot. I'm like, nah, I mean, I, I assume that, you know what I'm saying? But like, how much is a lot? She's like, no, like a lot. I'm like, no, but like, what is a lot? You know what I'm saying? She's like... How about I say this? It can be anywhere from six to seven figures a month. I was like, bro, that's crazy, bro. Y'all could be spending anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to a millions a month on Dua Lipa, which I get. It's Dua Lipa. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But that was when shit started to turn for me. And I, I got the argument she was trying to make to him. Is like, hey, you telling me about this 150K that you about to get from your investor. That shit cute. Like that's a, that's that's three weeks of Facebook ads for us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like in <laughs> like in this system. And I think on one hand that could be discouraging for as an artist, right? Because you know, because 
to them, like $150,000 is a lot of money, right? Yeah. Like when you come into that situation and then you kind of hear, like, man, this this number that I kind of aspire for is like a drop in the bucket compared to what it really could be. Um, but then on one hand, I also think it's, it's motivational. No, maybe not motivational, but it, it kind of brings you to a sense of reality because now I can assume, like, okay, they spend, you know, at least – X amount of money on Dua Lipa, you know what I'm saying, a year, I can go start doing some calculations and be like, man, is this shit really hitting like I think it's hitting? Or is it contextual to the amount of money that was spent? And maybe my $150,000 is on par contextually to what I got from it. You know what I'm saying? Not yep. the same exactly, but, you know, maybe her $20 million got her 100 billion streams or some shit, and your 150000 got you $100 million. You're like, you know, it's not exactly the same, but, you know, contextually it is what it is. So, but that conversation, like, bro, when I heard that, I'm like, man, Dua Lipa spend that. That type of money, bro, on her digital. That was just digital, bro. Like, that wasn't yeah. even considering, like, PR, press, all this other stuff. Yeah. That's when I was like, oh, no, bro. Like, artists need to hear things like this because they will go into a situation trying to mimic someone who is spending $20 million and, like, the budget isn't the same or even the work ethic, bro. Like, how many times have we heard artists go, like, oh, you know, I want to be, like, Playboy Cardi. Playboy Cardi doesn't post on Instagram. He doesn't post on TikTok. And it's like, yeah, but Playboy Cardi's label is probably spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. You know what I'm saying? You got a couple hundred thousand dollars a month? If so, mm-hmm. go for it. If not, yep. hey, man, get, get back to that content grind. You know what I'm saying? So I, I like that there are conversations like this to add context to, you know, not even just marketing. Because I think we hear all the time, like, your marketing is important, right? At this point, I'm assuming anyone that's listened to this channel has had that shit beat into their brain. But as an artist, uh, one way or another, you come across the conversation of, marketing is important but no one ever gives a number you know what i'm saying like no one ever puts yeah. numbers to that shit it's like oh it's important and the artist will be like hey so i got a thousand dollars so i could do what do a leap was doing I'm like well, hold no hold now man you know what i'm saying like you could, you could get shit moving but like no just be real with you you know what i'm saying unless some lucky shit happen but i think that needs to be out there more artists need a a a, a point to like shoot for you know what i'm saying like a a, a number to shoot for i think you know no, I agree because context is everything. Yeah. Right. Even if it helps you understand that this is why I'm not getting there, but forces you to at least focus on what does my progress look like. Yeah. Right. Or maybe if you can become aware of how much money the, all these artists are spending on different levels, then you can compare it to the right artists. You're like, oh, I'm I'm performing him when I spend my thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And that's the beauty of um like working with people who do it. Like that's one thing when people ask me like what's the value of working with the agency when we work and i say look man context is one of the biggest beauties of working with an agency people like us who have seen multiple things because one thing i see a lot of artists mess up on is they will have results and they don't know if these are good results or Mm -hmm. bad results yeah so i've seen artists stop campaigns early and they were killing it and it's like no bro keep going but they don't have the context to know it was good yeah. they just know i haven't hit what i wanted to yet yeah. it doesn't feel right and then i've seen some artists think they were killing it and it's like nah bro you need to slow that down bro like don't waste your money right but we have the context from different genres similar artists mm-hmm. different platforms different times of the month different times of the year we have all this context so that becomes one of the like superpowers of working with people who've done it in some form of fashion, right? It doesn't have to be an agency. It could be a, a manager who has multiple artists, a label, or you could at least just talk to communities. We we got our community, brandmannetwork.com. It's free. Hop in that thing. But like context is so important for getting yourself out of this forest, right? That's what we seek all the time. Yeah. Right? We, we go try to have conversations. That was why you kept on saying, hey, yo, but like, what do you mean by a lot yeah. of money? <laughs> yeah. We're always searching for context so we can better position ourselves and how we help artists or our expectations for campaigns and some of our other industry aspirations we, um, we want to do around artists. So like the industry is in some senses a, a dark box and we try mm-hmm. to help as much as possible, right? In, in, in bringing light on that box right but still there's so many pieces of information to gain um and talk to as many people as you can to figure out what they're doing or people that they know are doing so like that's definitely one of the biggest takeaways um that context aspect of it the beauty of it yeah because boy you know like when 50 talked about jay not releasing into unless he had the money to control that reception but then throwing that 20 million number out there i was like man 
Like that's <laughs> that's some cash. But yeah. you also look at how the older artists are feeling a certain level of pain because they're not getting that 20 oh, anymore. Yeah, yeah, and I'm Beyonce and Mariah. I'm <laughs> not getting that 20, even though I am Beyonce and Mariah. I got to finesse and bring together other deals and things to mm-hmm. still mimic a sim- similar level. But um, yeah, we would love to hear that conversation. We would want to um, continue that conversation um, through in different pods and probably have some people on, but definitely want to know what y'all think. So, like this video and comment on this convo. What do y'all think? What's your perspective on, on it? But on top of that, all right, moving on to the next thing, man, Michael Jackson, the legend himself, this dude, I've been telling people for years, people got to put some respect on buddy name. All right. This guy, he has a clip that is going semi-viral at the moment. And I want to play this clip from Michael Jackson. And y'all tell me what y'all think. All right, so he said he generated a lot of money for Sony, several billions, and they really think my mind's always just on music, all right? And, singing, and, I, and it usually is, but they never thought that this performer myself would outthink them. Now I'm a free agent. I just owe Sony one more album. It's just a box set, really, with two new songs, which I've written ages ago. <laughs> So I'm leaving Sony a free agent, owning half of Sony. I own half of Sony's publishing, and, and I'm leaving them, and they're very angry at me because of it, but um, I just did good business, you know? The way, <laughs> the way he said that, bro, he, uh, that, that was, was kind of like a flex and, and, and dig at the same just time. Do good right? business. I just do a good business, just you know? Business. So I love that he said they didn't think that I would outthink them, a performer, right? Mm-hmm. Thinking these artists can't fool us they're the ones that we fool it says a lot about how artists perceive and are looked at but let's let, let me finish everything that he's saying so the way they get revenge the way they get revenge is to try and destroy my album so yeah man i think like many people have heard that michael has owned like half a sony at one point yes, hmm. but what i didn't know so Mike was out here talking about it like that. Yeah, same. Yeah. I thought it was something we learned like after his death. You know? yeah, yeah, I ain't nobody was out here like just speaking on the sh- on the stage in front of people. I mean, I, I imagine that didn't make people feel any better about yeah. it, right? And there's a couple other clips though. Like I, we, we want to talk about the genius of not only Michael, but the genius that artists have the ability to tap into when it comes to the industry as a whole, entrepreneurship as a whole, because one thing we're big on is like the money outside music or beyond just the streams itself, right? Whether that's merch, whether that's shows and different types of experience, we want to keep pushing that because enough, a lot of um, artists aren't talking about that enough or people aren't talking about that or encouraging artists to do that enough. So even as we grow, we're going to have like more, Content creator, entrepreneurs, artists, entrepreneurs are figuring out people are, are getting that money because I'm interested myself. Yeah, but yeah. but man, I want to share a couple things with Michael while we're on this topic, because I mean, brother is really doing it right. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to even play this one clip. I'm going to find this other clip and you're going to be like, man, this this guy, Michael, was something different. But the clip I was going to play was just Dick, uh, Dick Gregory having people read off some of the artists that Michael owned, like uh, the Beatles, Eminem, Beyonce. I have a Sony, man. Just just pick yeah. a name, right? But it's another clip I'm, I'm about to pull up. Check this out. Many of y'all will not believe that. Very few people have heard this that I know. All right, here's a clip of Piers Morgan, Michael Jackson's father, Joe Jackson, is being interviewed. Listen up for the people who are just listening and check this out for the people who are actually viewing on YouTube. Dude, let me bring you in here because you were uh, a business manager for Michael for a very long time. Uh, you've brought some fascinating tapes. These are audio tapes. And I want to just go through some of this because uh, I once interviewed Michael in the late 90s and I was struck that there was another Michael Jackson here, the businessman. And I want to play uh, a tape before I come to you. This is him discussing with you, I think, uh, about a plan to buy Marvel, the comic business, back in 2001 or two, I think it was. Let's listen to this. We could easily go into Universal and buy We would own Jaws, E.T., Close Encounters, you know, all the classics from, uh, from, from uh, Universal, own all that stuff that would allow us 
to do a universal, I mean, a channel. Part of the Marvel channel can be not only the Marvel characters, but Marvel films like the catalog. We could do anything we want from restaurants to, to retail, theme parks. Now, you actually got the financing in place, I believe, for this deal. Then came the, the scandal court cases, and it all got put on the back burner. Disney ended up buying Marvel and doing exactly what Michael had predicted and making a fortune at it. Tell me about this. That was the second part of his life. He... All right, I'm going to leave it right there. We'll put the link in the description for y'all to find or something like that. But, Corey, I want to get your first reaction on, on that clip because I've seen it before. I want to know what you think. Yeah, I mean, I was literally about to say what he said. I was like, damn, sounds like exactly what Disney did, bro. Like, <laughs> it just, like, he was coming up with the MCU before, before they were coming up with the MCU. But, nah, man, this is, it's interesting because I personally thought that the whole conversation of buying IP and, like, how lucrative IP buying was, I thought that was a relatively new conversation. You know, like, maybe last 10 years or so. Um, and maybe it is, like maybe it is still a relatively like new like mass conversation. But mm-hmm. the other fact that, but he was thinking about that back then. Like y'all want to buy Sony, you know, one of the largest, um, you know, that what has one of the largest publishing catalogs, but however many of the biggest artists out. I want to buy Marvel, you know what I'm saying? Um, one of the largest IPs ever created, right? And just literally just a limitless supply of money because of all the characters that they have and, and the worlds <laughs> we can build into, and. I know, like, it's maybe been about three or four years or so of me personally even knowing, like, how lucrative catalog buying is on the music side. Right. Right, like that. I, I kind of got put onto that um, through my homie David, who works for a publishing company. He's the one that, that was just like, bro, like, you think, like, for those of you, bro, they be thinking, like, rappers make money, bro, go look up hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, go look up hypnosis and, yeah. and just the type of money they spend on catalog. So... But I I didn't even think about like movie IP, right? Or like like you know what I'm saying, like um that type of IP and, and just, you know, what could kinda come from that. So but he literally was like thirty, forty years ahead of his time with that shit. Bro, it's it's ridiculous, man. Like the way he he saw the game and like you said, understood IP. And I like compare the artists today as to superheroes, right? Mm. That's the image. All right. So it's seeing those worlds combine and collide there's no one who really did that better so far than michael jackson yeah because if you look at michael jackson he had a video game on sega yeah like i remember playing that off the wall game he has a little white suit walking around or whatever yeah. he had a movie that had like his big old statue in it you know what i mean like he i mean he had like uh, in that movie, I think that was that same movie. It was like the little kid dressed up um, as him in the bad video. Like he had all these different variations and imaginations of himself, and did these different worlds and characters. So he understood the IP just from his own career, probably. Yeah, you yeah, know what I mean. Because point, yeah. nobody else really did it to that extent themselves. But you know what? When I think about it too, Walt Disney was always like his north star. He mentioned Walt Disney, like Disney so much and studying that world and creating that to the point he, you know, he created his own theme park, Neverland. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I guess when I go through it that way, it makes sense that he understands IP because of what he's done himself looking up to Disney. Oh, oh, wow. Like Disney are the ones who who went ahead and bought that. Um, It, it makes sense. But like I think many artists can take from that not only the value of their own catalog or the value of like buying some other ip but just their own ip and creating something that's of that type of value having a character because you could just be an artist but every artist doesn't have the like character and point of view that comes with building an ip value like having a tv show cartoon whatever that looks like like we know andre 2000 did his TV show, mm-hmm. right? And that actually kind of, I feel like, helped codify what Andre 3000 is as a character. He was that in rap, but when you saw it in as a cartoon, it made sense and yeah. gave you a stronger understanding of who Andre is, right? Snoop Dogg 
I think is the clearest example today of someone who has IP in like 50 directions. Like you can, you can just see so many things. They just came out with not Snoop Loops because they got sued for Snoop using that. Loops. All right. They can't use, <laughs> they can't use that term Snoop Loops. So he call them Snoop something else now. It's some serious. Snoop O's, maybe. No, Something like that. Man, that's crazy, bro. <laughs> Snoop O's is wild. Hey, you just throwing shit out there, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, but, that's, but I think it might have been Snoop O's. But he's getting sued for it, but Snoop, like the character you know, yeah. right? Snoop, it wouldn't be surprising to see him have a cartoon if he hasn't had one already, right? But you can see it. It's there, yeah. right? There's so many iterations. Snoop in the metaverse like what the all that feels like we know what the wee brand extensions all look like because his character is so strong his yeah. image is so strong and maybe everybody won't be able to do it to snoop's extent but man like there's so many variations of that and everything doesn't have to be the typical cartoon movie da 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 but everything is there like uh, every time you see a character in a book right all right, every time, like anywhere you see characters, IP, right? On your cereal box, yeah. All right, on your candy, on your the toys, action figures, all of that, right? Are streams of income, which is why these things are so valuable. But it's hard to monetize them if you don't know how to monetize them. You don't have the team set in place. But boy, if you do, that yeah. that number is crazy. Yeah, it makes me wonder too. Like, I wonder if, like, Michael's thought process was, "Hey, I could continue building out my IP, right, and figuring out these directions mm -hmm. that I can shoot off in, or I can just go buy some shit that's already shot off in directions that you know maybe I don't feel like I can go in, but there's definitely money to be made there." But he's talking right. about buying Jaws and ET. You know what I'm saying? Like, Bruh. like the doors that that would have <laughs> opened for him would have been doors that he probably would have never touched through his own IP, right, right. and his own artistry. And so I give him, you know, kudos for that, bro. Like even just thinking that far ahead because it's so wild, bro. If he, if he had gotten that Marvel deal, bro, with the Sony thing, bro. I mean, you he was know, already you know, dangerous. Some of them, some conspiracy theory, <laughs> true, bro. I can, I can understand. You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, we gotta get this motherfucker out of here. Like, bro, he, <laughs> he gonna bring too much hope to, <laughs> to the future, bro. Like, no, especially bro. now knowing what Marvel went today, bro. That's wild to think. That's crazy to think about, bro. Bro, yeah, like out, to be out here thinking like that. That that's that's it's pretty scary for for the industry. Yeah, bro, right? a Terrible. single artist. Yeah, the to be the artist performer, and you know why it's even more terrifying actually, because it's not just an owner. The owners are scary in themselves. This person owns the majority or something, right? Um, and depending on who you are, right, that might be scary if you don't like that person or it's coming from the outside, so they're not a part of your group. You you didn't let them in the room, right? Yeah. That can be scary. Then you talk about owning half of that company of all these various artists and then a Marvel situation, right? But when you combine that owner being one of the biggest fucking artists ever, the and platform. what are the biggest, yes, the platform, the mm -hmm. biggest artist ever can has a platform to touch the people directly. Yeah. So you can control the people and you have the top. I feel like, did we just talk about this? Right. Having the bottom and the top. No, I was watching a podcast and they were talking about, they were talking about uh, Andrew Tate. His problem is he doesn't really have a whole bunch of allies at the top yet. He mm. just went to jail or something like that. Mm. Right. But he has so many people that are his fans and follow him. So that platform is why he's so dangerous to so many of these people at the top, right? You get some allies, then you're solidified on both sides, right? Yeah. Well, you have this guy who can control so many people. You got people passing out, like the big, one of the biggest platforms, megaphones ever. And then you have ownership at the top on this side. It's, I mean, look, bro, that's, that's something different. Yeah, bro. I mean, I don't think we've seen it. I mean, yeah, we we haven't seen that. Yeah, I don't yeah. think. Yeah, I can't even think of anyone that's gotten even remotely close. close yeah, remotely close. Yeah, bro, that's crazy. Because he would have definitely been on stage moonwalking in an ET shirt, bro. If he had got that shit, like <laughs> selling merch, bro. Yeah, hundred percent, bro. Why not? Like all Why proceeds not? basically come back to me one way or another. I will do it. Yeah. You know? If I had ET right, bro. If I own ET IP, bro, we'd be wearing EP uh, ET. Shirts on every podcast, bro. Easy. On home, man. <laughs> on home, man. Like, yeah, it, we could go like into that conversation on a whole another level. But 
we're just going to stop it here because there's another topic to, to tackle and we want to get y'all out of here. So DDG mm. saying that his rap money isn't where he gets most of his money. Okay. okay. DDG says where he gets most of his money is not his rap money. So where does he get most of his money from? Well, he says YouTube. Right, not gonna lie, YouTubers and streamers make more money than rappers, and it's not even close. Now, I think many of us might assume YouTubers make more money than most rappers. Mm. I think we would assume. Well, mm. you don't think that? No, I don't maybe, think so, man. You're right. Maybe people don't know <laughs> enough. Yeah. I think I'm so you know ingrained in this <laughs> and have seen so much of both sides. That's just natural for me. I'm in that bubble now, but. Yes, it's not even close. And the money comes so much faster for so much less. I don't even want to say effort, but investment. Yeah. Right? I don't have to. Once I have my equipment, I'm good. I'm not thinking about touring. I'm not thinking about marketing in so many ways. For many of these these people, they're just posting on a platform and growing. Right? I'm not paying for an advertising campaign, an influencer campaign, none of that stuff. Right? And then I'm just so I not only do I spend less money, I still get more money. And oh, man, so we talk about sponsorships, right? We talk about YouTube advertising dollars. Somebody like DDG is probably making probably hundred k a month yeah, at I least. Was, I would guess, yeah, at least one one fifty. Yeah, like off of YouTube video views. YouTube video views. We're not even talking about sponsorships. Yeah, that's just a start. That's the floor. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's it's ridiculous that what some of these content creators are seeing. All right. So everybody's obviously not on that level, but even on your way up, right? You're seeing more and more advertising dollars. So it's not surprising, again, for me that that rap money that comes different, right? Uh, in different ways. You have to tour. So you have to put in that work and you're yeah. not going to have video views continue to trickle um trickle in it's not surprising to me that he's making more money yeah bro and the game is different bro it's like because i I like that he kept it to rap right and we talk a lot about rap has this issue sometimes with falling victim to the the image that um consumers have of rappers right Mm. and like consumers tend to think of rappers as like these larger than life people who have a lot of money that's the that's the Common perception of rappers right. versus a YouTuber, bro. You could be, you could be the the brokest motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? We're shooting your videos off of your your iPhone six, yep. and the audience is gonna be cool with that. You know what I'm saying? Like they're gonna be like, "Oh, we get it. You're growing. You're starting out. We're we're gonna watch you grow along the way, and you making money along that path, bro." Versus artists, a lot of times, especially rappers, bro. I don't think get that same like grace. You know what I'm saying they don't get that same nah. benefit. Though. It's like, oh, you are a rapper and you do not look lit. Oh no, nah, bro. We not we not <laughs> fucking with you because if you were lit, you would you would look like it, right? Yep. And so it's like YouTubers get so much grace, or content creators in general get so much grace that the typical music artist doesn't get, which allows them, I think, to build uh, a lot more cheaply, right? They we talk a lot of times about how they have a different mentality than artists, which is why I always kind of um gave DDG his flowers. Is I mean, he came into music with a YouTuber mentality, right? And the YouTuber mentality is like, bro, I'm just gonna keep post, post, posting. You know what I'm saying like this shit gonna hit. Mm-hmm. In a time where you know other artists, um, or yeah, at least when he was coming up, I, I think that the, con- the content conversation was really just getting started around the time like DG started breaking yeah. through. And so yeah, like that's why I trust his opinion, but he's seen both sides of it. Yeah, I got you know what I'm saying this YouTube money, I've made rap money. He's probably looking at both sides like, mm. it's the reason he ain't stopped making his YouTube videos. You know what I'm saying? Well, well yeah. I think there was a point where he did stop making and he came back. He did, yeah, for yeah, he sure. came back, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, bro, like, I think we're moving into a point where probably in the next, like, two to three years, I would say, bro, like, YouTubers and streamers, I think, are going to start to overtake rappers in terms of public persona. We got Mr. Beast out there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We got people like Aiden Ross, people like Kyle Sinat, Speed, you know what I'm saying? Like, all these streamer personalities who are starting to move really close to pop culture personality. And all it takes is one to break the door down. You know what I'm saying? Um, once one breaks through, you know, it opens up the doors for the rest of them. And I think that like these types of creators are a little bit more relatable than the average rapper, which is going to be what allows like a lot more than the flourish. You know what I'm saying? Cause like I said, I, I can just be a relatable person with my iPhone 
and you know what I'm saying, some free time. And there's a possibility that I could make just as much money, if not more money, than these artists who it takes hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to invest in to get them to the same level that, that yeah. I get to. You know, like if I was an investor today, I honestly might put my money into a Twitch personality before I put it into a rapper. No, nah, I can the, see that. Because the overhead cost is a lot lower. Could, yeah, yeah, 100%. I can see that. And I think artists have that edge from a standpoint of connecting with people through music, which is still yeah. a very unique connection. But in terms of the inspiration of, I want to be like this when I grow up, they're losing a lot of that cultural clout. Like, yeah, I want to be a Twitch streamer. I want to be a YouTuber. That's what the number one answer I've heard from many kids, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, they are losing that, um, that allure that comes with that. And it's just another form of competition that artists have. Like, yeah, you're competing with artists. We always say that, but you're also competing with everyone else. And if the, the pedestal that artists are being put on has dropped a bit mm -hmm. i wonder what that's going to look like financially or just the other aftershocks of that happening yeah. we don't quite see that and i haven't spent too much time trying to you know project and estimate what that could look like but it's definitely going to be interesting to see the artist's place in society the pop culture artist's place in society not have as much impact as it has before because these other forms of competition just didn't exist. You had actors and artists, yeah. basically. That was it. You know, comedians, but a lot of them to rise up, especially in old days, use acting as a part of like a way to expand even larger and hit a hit a base. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, now the game is damn near everybody. Yeah, I told you, your fans are your competition. <laughs> yeah, bro, and it's like we know it can happen. I I was watching this uh YouTube video a couple of days ago about Tower Banks. Don't ask me why, but I was watching this, this YouTube doc about Tower Banks, right. and I remember at one point in the doc they mentioned how in the early '90s the like supermodels used to rival like movie stars in terms of popularity. Yes, they you did. Know, you know what I'm saying? Remember, yes. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, that's wild. Think about because I, I don't I don't think. Supermodels even come Who's close. Who's a man. supermodel now? Who yeah. is a supermodel? Exactly. Now? So yeah. it's like so we have examples in history of these larger than life professions kind of falling to the wayside. Yep. So it's not impossible for you know us to wake up five years from now and like you said, kids are gonna like be a rapper. So I can have my life at risk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everywhere I go and get stuck in these deals. No, I'm going to be a Twitch streamer. Mm -hmm. or I'm going to be a YouTuber. I'm going to be a TikToker. And you can't fault them for that because I feel them, bro. Like I said, I think I think that if more people were hip to just how much money a lot of these content creators make, I do think there'll be a lot more people who say, hey, I want to be a Twitch streamer than, hey, I want to be a music artist. Because mm -hmm. some of y'all like to hide it behind, like, you know, creativity and, and passion and shit. But a lot of y'all really just trying to make some money. You know what I'm yeah. saying? If we've been completely honest. And yeah. usually just through a creative mean. Like, how many music artists do we know that do other creative things? And I feel like if that other creative thing popped before the music did, they would chase it. And we actually have examples of that. How many actors in Hollywood or motherfuckers that were trying to rap and sing first, you know what I'm saying? But acting clicked better for them. And even vice versa. Like I'm sure there are artists that probably try to be in Hollywood, but music was better for them, right? So a lot of them were just people with this creative desire and are looking for a way to make money off of it. So it's like... I, I think we're going to get to that, bro. There's, there's way too many examples out there that feel more relatable, more accessible than the typical music artist. And those people are going to be a part of the reason why the narrative change changes. Bro, I think that's very, very possible. Yeah. Right? The way disco didn't, like, last. It just died damn near overnight. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Supermodels, they died in front of people's face and they and people missed it. Yeah. All right. I think people in the industry probably are more aware of it. And there's still a supermodel in terms of the top tier. Yeah. But one, there's fewer of them. Right. And the awareness of them is far less. You knew Giselle and Tyra. There's a couple others uh, with Heidi Klum. Right. And I don't follow the shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but that's how big of an impact it had. You don't even have to really know to know. And they were able to use, and what makes them supermodels, right, is 
the rest of culture beyond the trade knew about them, yeah. right? Superstars in terms of artists, the rest of culture beyond the industry and their primary fan base is aware of them, yeah. right? So if you lose that allure, that's when it's becoming a thing, just like Mr. Beast. A lot of people know Mr. Beast. They know of this Mr. Beast by day. I've never seen a video, but this Mr. Beast guy, they would know he's some kind of YouTuber. Yeah, bro. right. Yeah, and no rapper flex like Mr. Beast been flexing. So you know <laughs> the kids that are attracted yeah. to to flexing, they 100 percent want to take the Mr. Hey, Beast route, bro. For real, <laughs> spending a million dollars for a video, and when you talk about doing it for the money. Just to create, look, at least get enough money to then make whatever creative decisions you want. Yeah. Period. Whether it's gonna be rap or more videos and all and things like that. That's why I was, I was always hard on uh, many artists that I saw to be multiple um, in all in their creativity, but it would be like, I just want to do this music thing. Like I'm gonna avoid my other talents that could at least get me out of this job I hate. Right. Like. Because I don't want to be stuck in a YouTuber box. But you could get out of that job you hate, right? And then be working independently, making plenty of money there, and then figuring it out. Yeah. But, you know, I think people are still in that space where they didn't understand that you actually can break that box. It's not oftentimes because they know you as YouTube. It's because your music isn't as good as your YouTube videos. Your music just isn't good. So why as a, a upcoming kid why would i not go into this box where i see people making way more money let alone the fact even though it's hard to avoid any kind of screwing in any industry i get screwed at a higher level or let's put it this way i get screwed after i've made more money versus i haven't even made a dime yet and i'm getting screwed that's yeah. what artists are facing it's like bro i ain't seen no money and y'all are already screwing me on these contracts yeah these youtubers i'm could be making a mil plus off of youtube alone before anybody does any kind of business with me and then you know i might find some troubles yeah that's a different game yeah. right you know it's like it's not that you want to be screwed at all but <laughs> if i can make a million before i even have that risk why not? Yeah. Right? Because we only share horror stories about music and what it's like to be an artist. So we're not even doing a good job in marketing. <laughs> 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 wanting to be an artist. It's not a good marketing campaign. We want to be an artist these days. Man, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Bro. Whoever, whoever's behind the uh, job PR is on a terrible job. <laughs> and the barrier to entry is so much lower, bro. It's like, yeah. I don't know a kid today that doesn't have a cell phone. So it's like, yeah. in theory, they could all decide to be streamers right now, make it possible. If they yes. decide to be rappers, that's a whole process. I gotta find a studio. Yeah. Right. I gotta, you know what I'm saying, figure out all the other things it takes to get it online. But it costs money to put the music out, but you gotta upload a YouTube video for free. Yeah. Like I gotta learn how to rhyme words. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> like put them together, make them sound good. People gotta like it. But I, I could just drop a video. Yeah. And 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 reiterate, which is crazy. It's like, yeah, it is so much easier. To put out music, but yeah, it's still not as easy as just creating a YouTube video. Yeah, bro. Give me some tips. I could just talk about being in 12th grade and what it's like being in 12th grade and go viral. Yeah. Right? You know, like, yeah. It's, it's crazy. It really is. Um, but you have any lasting statements on this topic? Nah, man. I feel like we said a lot. Hey. Shout out to DDG. <laughs> Shout out to DDG. <laughs> Been watching you for a while, and I said it. He would be one of the best to do it in terms of make that transition. And so far, he's proven that right. This is No Labels Necessary. I'm Brandman Sean. I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.